This is the IELTS listening test. Part 1 You will hear a tourist talking to a tourist information officer. Before you start listening, you have 30 seconds to look at questions 1 to 4. Now we shall begin. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Good afternoon. Can I help you? Yes, I've just arrived in town and I was wondering if I could get some maps and some ideas about what to do while I'm here. Sure. This map is a good one for the main attractions in town, like the zoo, the opera house, the botanical gardens. Is that the kind of thing you are looking for or are you more interested in shopping? Both, actually. Well, I recommend doing your shopping later, as the best places to shop are quite away from here. How about starting with the Opera House? Yes, I've seen a lot of pictures of it, and I've heard it's one place I should definitely go. Yes, it's on the top of most people's lists, because it's so well known. There are tours of the building, but try to get a ticket to performance if you can. But remember, shows are often sold out, so go to the box office early if you're interested. Sounds good. And what about the zoo? Is it far from here? Not too far, but it's definitely worth a visit. Really? Yes, yeah, some new exhibits have just opened, which let visitors see the animals, and then the keepers give hourly talks and tours on different animals. All right. But if you do decide to go, I'd recommend going in the afternoon, as there are usually a lot of people there in the morning with school groups. Thanks, but I'm not that interested in going there. So how about the art gallery? New exhibition has just opened and it's a great place to have lunch. Try the coffee shop or take a sandwich and have it in the sculpture garden. It's such a quiet place to relax you forget you're in the middle of town. Good idea. And I've heard that the botanical gardens are also a nice place to have lunch. Yes. Even though it's also right in the middle of town, it has a huge selection of native plants. In fact, you won't find such a wide selection of rare species anywhere else in the country. Hmm, I might head down there and take a look. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 5 to 10. And how do I get to the other places? Well, look at your map. The art gallery isn't far from Central Station. Just go up Main Street and cross over River Road. It's on the left, opposite the post office. And the botanical gardens? They're on the river. Go along River Road towards Parkville, cross the bridge, then it's on your left. You won't miss it. There are signs from the bridge. 
Isn't the zoo by the river too? Yes, it isn't far from the botanical gardens. Go down River Road again towards Parkville, but this time it's on your left, just before the bridge. Now, while I'm here, I'd like to go out for dinner, but I've got no idea what the restaurants are like. Well, we've got lots of restaurants in and around town. It just depends on what you're looking for. Any suggestions? Yes, there's the Grand Hotel, which is a big five-star hotel not far from here. It's international-style food, but it is a little expensive. Expect to pay around fifty dollars per head there. Gosh, that's quite a lot. Yes, but there are no surprises on the menu, so there's always something for everyone. Anything a little smaller and maybe cheaper? Yes, Mama's is more affordable. It's a little place tucked in behind the Grand, which serves authentic local food. It's one of the few restaurants where you can try the local cuisine. It's a great place, but you should know that it closes early. Last orders at nine. Oh, that's no good. I don't want to go somewhere that closes that early. I want to make a night of it. Then there's the Riverside Restaurant, which specialises in seafood. Sounds good. Yes, it's not too expensive either. Just average, but the view is sensational. People go there just to look at the view across the river over the town. The place has a great atmosphere too. It's the place to be seen, so you'll need a reservation, or you'll never get a table. I'll give them a call now. Thanks for your help. You're welcome. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You will hear an employee giving a tour of a fast food restaurant to a group of students. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you all hear me? Good. Let's go through to the kitchen now so you can see the full operation of the restaurant. First, I want to emphasize the importance of kitchen hygiene. It's crucial for our business reputation. On the wall here, we have a dispenser of plastic shower caps. Forget about fashion statements. Everyone who goes into the kitchen must wear one to protect against stray hairs getting into the food. Please take one and put it on now. Alongside it is the sanitizer. Again, you all need to use this and scrub your hands thoroughly before we go in. Also, please be aware that this is a working kitchen, so many of the counter surfaces inside could be hot. It's best not to touch anything as you go through, just in case. It's just basic safety and common sense. You'll notice the number pad on the door here. We have full security in the kitchen. Now that most people pay with a bank card rather than cash, there's no great concern about robbery. Again, it's our reputation that we are protecting here. 
We restrict access mainly because we need to be certain that our food cannot be contaminated and that our workers can get on with the job without interference from unauthorized people. Right, come on in. First, here's the storeroom. Our ordering systems are very efficient. The quantities in each burger must be exact, and this is ensured by the various food dispensers we use. For example, 20 mils of our famous home brand mayonnaise is dispensed in our most popular burger. So, at the end of the day, when I check how many burgers have been sold or binned, I know if the mayonnaise stocks are running low and I can order more. Okay, now on to the operational side of things. Consistency is the key here. Every burger in any of the brand's restaurants should have the same quantities of the same ingredients, so that all our customers are sure of what they're ordering. Our delivery standard is to keep the customer waiting no longer than two minutes for their burger. That's truly fast food. We don't like wastage, so we analyze our sales statistics to predict the demand for each day, and even the times of day when there is most need. However, to make sure that we can meet the production targets, we can't avoid some waste. At busy times, sometimes there'll be a stack of six burgers in the warming rack. We know these won't stay at their best for long, so after ten minutes, they must go into the bin. Another key area is efficient staffing. We have some full-time staff, of course, but part-time staff will do maybe two hours at noon and another two at six and other casual staff are on call at peak times. This really helps us with efficiency of service and the economy of the operation. We train all our staff at all the different stations, but when we're busy, each member of staff works at one particular station, grilling the buns, cooking the meat, adding salad, cheese, and sauces, or packaging. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. I'm sure you've all seen our famous paper tray covers. They're an important part of our marketing strategy. If you look on the reverse side, you'll see a food analysis of all our products, the grams of fat, the carbohydrates, and so on. You may be asking yourself, how can we be sure these are accurate? Well, quantities are a key issue here. With the ice cream, for example, we train our staff to serve exactly 150 grams of ice cream into a cone and 200 grams into the plastic cups. This allows us to oversee our stocks for reordering and also gives reliability. The key aspect for us, though, is that we are being accurate about nutritional information. This is so important that head office sends us secret customers they will take an order back to a table and weigh and measure the ingredients. Okay, now on to sales. On our left, you can see the two women wearing headphones. They communicate with each other, with the public, and with the food preparation team. The drive through that they're servicing is a very important part of our business. In fact, it generates one-third of our revenue. The other two-thirds comes from restaurant visitors and about 20% of that comes from our themed children's parties. Now we'll look at another aspect of our service. Just cluster around this till. The till is the point of sale, and as you see, our products are pictured on the keyboard as well as named. The till operator just taps in the client's order by choosing the correct picture. As soon as the order is confirmed by cash or card payment, it appears on two screens, one above the cooking areas, and one behind the servers. 
This dual system means that the staff at the cooking stations get good notice of any buildup in demand, and the servers have an on-screen reminder of the earlier orders they've taken. They can also use this to prepare any drinks or ice creams that customers have ordered. When the hot food is delivered, the order is complete, so they delete the entry on that screen. That keeps everything instantly up to date. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear a conversation between a professor and a researcher about road safety research. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 21 to 26. Well, thanks for coming in, Adam. It's nice to begin meeting some of the research team. Oh, Professor Wilcox, w welcome to the Institute for Road Safety. Oh, let's be a little less formal. You should all call me Jane, OK? Mm -hmm. All right, then. Well, you know, my aim is to meet all the junior researchers and have you explain your research interests. Of course, I've read some of your reports, but you may not have written up everything you're doing just yet. So, you've been looking into accident causation and mobile phone use, is that correct? Yes, that's right. Um, I've been working with Jamila, and we think it's something we really have to get to grips with at the Institute, uh, because there hasn't been enough research on distraction and accident rates. And now that mobile devices are so common, I mean, even among older age groups, we felt it was worthy of study. Right. So how have you approached the issue? Well, we've done a survey of the literature, of course, and um, looked into some of the main research methods, as well as different approaches to controlling mobile device use while driving. Mm -hmm. uh, there seems to be some agreement that different research methods suit different kinds of research questions. So, I'll explain some of our conclusions. One relatively new approach is to use uh, driving simulators, rather like a giant video game where drivers are put through a controlled driving course and their reactions are monitored. Now, this allows researchers to test out their assumptions uh, because they have complete control over the road conditions, of course, including weather and uh, other vehicles, Simulators allow perfectly timed interruptions from incoming mobile phone calls or um, instructions to send a text and so on. But the simulator machines are very expensive and uh, may not actually show reactions in real road conditions. Okay. So then there have been one or two limited studies of real observed driving using special police cameras. Mm -hmm. Um, these are set up at specific road locations and drivers are secretly filmed as they pass the camera with the registration plate not visible for privacy reasons. So this approach is good for showing us how people use handheld phones in particular. Of course, if they're using hands-free connections, well, that may or may not be visible, so it isn't counted. 
Uh, the reason that this is limited is that obtaining the rights to see and use the video footage is a legal nightmare. But it does allow for the gathering of group statistics, such as gender or approximate age divisions. Mm. Well, then the next approach is based on survey questionnaires. These are a bit more well, traditional, of course. There is the usual issue around the fact that participation is voluntary, so you may get some bias in the statistics, but they are useful for surveying large numbers of drivers and quick data analysis. You can incorporate questions on a wider range of topics, of course. The last method we've looked into is um, small group research, or focus groups, I should say. That's relatively easy to set up, and the major point in its favor is how revealing it can be about drivers' attitudes, not only to phone use, but to some of the measures proposed to try to control their behavior with mobile devices. Uh, you can get into some detail there, although the analysis and transcription takes time, and one must be careful not to generalize. I mean, the findings are not hard data after all, but more qualitative, really. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. So, do you have any proposed directions for your own research? Mm, well, yes. For a while we were thinking of trying to put together a study of videos of observed driving in real conditions using the police cameras, as I mentioned. Um, and I, as I said, we did try to get access to the video footage, but access is so restricted that, well, we abandoned that idea. Mm -hmm. Then there's the driving simulator at the National University, which generates a lot of data. Uh, we don't have the resources to purchase time on this machine to set up our own study, but we have reached an agreement with the Human Sciences Department at the National University. That's good. Yes, we're going to share one of their sets of data so we can do our own analysis. We're looking at a particular group of drivers and their eye movements um, immediately after they receive a mobile call. We, we hope to send in a couple of articles to major journals out of this one. Mm -hmm. Then we put together a questionnaire on attitudes of drivers. Um, in particular, on attitudes to measures designed to prevent mobile phone use, such as punishments. We considered a focus group on this, but in the end we felt that we needed the larger number of participants offered by a telephone survey. Okay. Well, I'll have a look at your proposals on those ideas when I've settled in. I haven't worked much with telephone surveys myself, but I do know you have to be very careful how you identify yourself to the participants and be prepared to spend a lot of time making calls in order to get the numbers, more so than with postal surveys. Mm. And have you considered using live observers, making real-time traffic observations? Mm. I've heard that in Britain there's a research group using psychology students to sit at road intersections for short periods of time. They record their observations on computer tablets as drivers go through the lights, which is often a time when they start making a call. Hmm. Yeah, great idea. Thanks, Jane. I can see it's going to be very useful working with you. That is the end of part three. 
You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part 3. Part 4 Sally McBean is an archaeological scientist. In the following talk, she discusses the latest research on the Iceman. Before you start listening, you have 30 seconds to look at questions 31 to 40. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. You may remember that in 1991, a couple who were hiking high in the mountains on the border of Italy and Austria found the body of a man who died 5,300 years ago. This makes him older than the Egyptian mummies. This corpse was later given the nickname the Iceman. Fortunately, a complete set of clothes and a variety of gear were found on or near the corpse and they give us further clues as to his identity. I'd like to speak to you today about some of the latest findings on the Iceman. Scientists have learned from the Iceman's corpse in the same way detectives investigating a murder gather clues from the victim's body. The study of the Iceman's bones show that he was 46 years old at the time of death, which is relatively old for people at that time. There was speculation as to where he'd come from originally, because the area where the corpse was found is not a place which is suitable for permanent human settlement. It's nearly always covered by snow and ice, but in 1991, the ice had melted due to the unusually warm weather and because of dust which had blown there from the Sahara. Subsequently, DNA analysis indicated that he belonged to a group from central northern Europe rather than from Mediterranean people who lived not very far to the south of the spot where his body was found. Yet it seems he may have moved around somewhat during his life. Although exactly where he spent his life is unknown, investigation of his tooth enamel suggests that he grew up in one place and then spent several decades in another area. Due to his age and what he ate, his teeth were in fact very worn. Samples taken from his stomach and intestines give us some clues as to what he'd eaten shortly before his death, including grains. However, samples of his hair show that he usually ate plants and the meat of several animals. He lived in a time long before the development of modern medicine, but the tattoos which appear on his back were probably there for the purpose of acupuncture therapy. It seems that he was not in a good state of health in the last six months of his life. There are three lines, known as Bose lines, on the single fingernail that was found. These lines occur if the nail stops growing due to illness and then starts growing again. It was initially assumed that he had died of the cold in autumn because of the presence of a piece of fruit which ripens in late summer. Yet, there is now strong botanical evidence that he died in spring. 
This is because pollen from the hop hornbeam tree was found in his intestines and that small tree blooms only in late spring. So he may have breathed some in or drunk some water containing pollen shortly before his death. The Iceman ate a primitive form of wheat which was baked into bread on an open fire. The meat he consumed included red deer and wild goat, but it seems not to have included seafood, most likely because he didn't live near the coast. Interestingly, the cap he was wearing was made from bear skin. Leaves of moss was found in his intestines. It appears that moss was not part of his diet, but had probably entered his mouth by accident. In those days, they had no paper bags or plastic wrapping, and so used moss to pack food in. Moss was a very handy plant, also being used by the Vikings and others as toilet paper. The equipment found around the body gives us many clues as to his way of life. He was well prepared for climbing through the mountain pass, with a jacket made from deer hide and goat hide, and a pair of shoes made from the skin of both goat and bear, and then insulated with grass. Over the top of it all, he was wearing a cape made from grass and bast, which is made from bark. In fact, this cape resembles capes worn by shepherds in the Balkans, and the site where he was found is near an area where shepherds traditionally take their flocks in summer. Yet, the theory that he was a shepherd has little else to support it. It's been proposed that he was a hunter due to the fact that he was carrying a bow and arrows. Some earlier ideas that he was a warrior or a trader of flint have been abandoned for lack of any supporting material. So what was he doing up there in the mountains, apparently by himself? Did he die from exhaustion and cold while running away from danger? Was he murdered? We may never know exactly what the cause of death was, because this would require an autopsy, which has not been allowed because it would cause too much damage to the corpse. X-rays have shown an object which appears to be an arrowhead in his back under his left shoulder. Yet, even if he was shot with an arrow, it was not necessarily the cause of death. There's a deep wound on his right hand from where he was stabbed with a knife and he was carrying an axe. Was it perhaps for his own protection against his enemies? The Iceman was found lying on a large rock and so it was believed initially that he had fallen asleep on the rock and then died. It's more likely that he died nearby and then floated into that position during periods when the ice had thawed. There are several indicators for this. Firstly, the awkward position of his left arm. Secondly, the position of his right hand, which was stuck under another rock. Thirdly, the missing outer layer of skin and the fact that some of his belongings are a few meters from the body. Despite these interesting findings, there are still very many things that we don't know about the Iceman. When the body was first removed, they thought it was a missing mountain climber, so a lot of evidence was destroyed. But hopefully, with further research, we will be able to solve some of the mysteries which still surround the Iceman. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have ten minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.